Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Can we get a bounce in this equity market? Three days of losses on the S&P, down 5%. A bounce this morning, just a little one. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, fighting the Fed. We don't know for the life of us why people still want to fight the Fed. Many investors are looking for a reason to be bullish. I think you are fighting the Fed if you're bullish. I don't think we're fighting the Fed. The market is giving you opportunity. Predicting this market is not clean cut. Any good news gets taken away by the Fed's need to tighten. Now it's black and white. They're very aggressive. What do we do here? We've got so many conflicting scenarios. So far, there's been some resilience. Corporate earnings have been resilient. Short-term indicators getting oversold. Markets are looking forward. You have to be opportunistic. You have to be patient. Joining us now to discuss Goldman's Ashish Shah, Emily Hill of Bowersock Capital. Emily, I want to begin with you. It was the headline of our conversations yesterday on this program to start the week, really get the week going. It was Sebastian Page of T. Rowe Price. You were fighting the Fed if you're bullish. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. I was, I was surprised and puzzled by the market's reaction to the Fed meeting in July. And I think the reason, the primary reason, or one of the primary reasons that, that Powell was so stern in Jackson Hole is because, you know, he clearly hadn't sent enough of a signal in the prior month. So, yes, I think, I think fighting the Fed is a foolish idea at the moment. Ashish Shah, if the Fed put is now a Fed call, how is that shaping your risk tolerance? Look, I, I think we're, we're taking a more opportunistic tone when it comes to markets. Um, you, know, you, you, you don't want to chase things here, but at the same time, when we have liquidations like you saw in June, you want to be able to be in a position to you know, take advantage of those dislocations. And I think we're going to get those. There's going to be a lot of back and forth through the data, and you want to set yourself up to be investing because sitting in cash is really expensive right now. Does that mean you need to have some dry powder, though, Ashish? And can you walk me through how much cash you would be holding at any given time through much of this year? Yeah, so so I, I think you do want dry powder. It, it's a question of where you put that cash. I mean, uh, you know, we're so used to after a decade of not earning anything in our bank accounts that like you look at what's available in the curve, you know, the market's pricing out almost 4%, uh, Fed getting to 4%. And you could capture that by actually moving out the curve just a little bit um, in fixed income, whether it's munis or taxable. So that's the Treasury curve, or is that the credit story? Can you walk me through that and get really specific on that, Ashish? Because, yes, they're going to get rates to 4%. Yes, rates are going to climb. But we're set to see some pretty weak data as well off the back of that as a consequence. So can you help me understand where you want to take that risk on the curve in terms of, say, the Treasury curve, or, for that matter, with credit? So I, I think the short answer is you can do both depending on your own risk tolerance. I think that credit, um, better quality credit in the IG space, uh, agency mortgages uh, looks very attractive here. Munis have cheapened up as the summer has kind of ended. And so if you've been looking to deploy tax exempt uh, money in kind of the two year space, you can earn two and a quarter percent in the muni space, uh, which you know you basically double at the highest tax brackets. Um, in credit, I think you know, you're gonna have a heavy supply month when it comes to bank loans and perhaps some high yield. Um, and I, I think that you know people are sitting in cash waiting for that. Um, whether it ends up disappointing or not, or whether people have built too much cash, I think we'll see. Uh, no question though, in July, uh, you know, the shortage of supply was really squeezing markets. I think we've undone that in, in a handful of days. Emily, where would you put some money to work right now? Well, first of all, I, I actually would disagree a little bit about cash. Uh, when, when inflation was at 9%, you know, I agree, cash drag on portfolios spiked. But at this point, you can get a six-month T-bill for three and a quarter percent. And so I would argue that actually cash is an asset class is back and i don't think it's foolish to hold you know directly you know a target of three to four percent in cash uh the you know the other but I, you know i'm not wild about cash in terms of its long-term returns 
So, you know, I think we're cautiously, op, you know, we're cautious about equity markets. You know, I would agree that we need to be op, that we need to be opportunistic. And if we see a retracement to the June we saw in low, uh, uh, the June low, then that's a good time to put some money to work. Uh, with regard to equities, we prefer the U.S. and small cap, which tends to be at least somewhat insulated from a strong dollar and from inflation globally. I think is we're, we're looking at better valuations relative to large cap than we've seen since the early 2000s. So if you're thinking about being op opportunistic, that's a good place to look. At 25 minutes away from the open and bound futures are positive, a half of 1% on the S&P, up eight tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq. Tons of Fed speak. Let's get you up to speed on that. First of all, with the Richmond Fed President, Tom Barkin. Take a listen. You've likely seen that over the last four meetings, we've raised rates 225 basis points. We've started shrinking our balance sheet, and we've signaled there are more rate increases to come. We're committed to returning inflation to our 2% target, and we'll do what it takes uh, to get there. Mike McKee, that was Barkin. We heard from Mester about 50 minutes ago. Yeah, uh, all the Fed officials are kind of coming up with the same message, and this is despite the fact that we've still got payrolls ahead of us and CPI to go. They may influence what happens in September, but not beyond that. Uh, we got the ADP numbers this morning, and they suggest that the job, pace of job gains slowed significantly in the month of September, uh, month of August. But remember, uh, they didn't publish for two months because they were redoing their whole series. And you look back, and uh, they show that after the pre-pandemic high, the economy lost 6.8 million jobs. The BLS says we lost... 20 million, 21 million jobs. So I'm not sure if this indicator is telling us anything that is useful. Uh, the jolts numbers yesterday scared the markets because we were up in terms of jobs available, 11 million, uh, two for every unemployed person. Does that stay that way? Does that suggest that the unemployment rate is going to rise or keep falling and then uh, average hourly earnings? We're going to get that on Friday. They've stabilized. So does the Fed really have to move on Friday? These are the forecasts for what we're going to see, 300,000 jobs. Does ADP go into that uh, in, for some changes? I'm not sure. We still have ISM to go before we get there. And that unemployment rate, not for, for, uh, forecast to change at all. So you end up with uh, what Loretta Mester said, sort of uh, summing up what everybody has been saying at the Fed. It'll be necessary to move the Fed funds rate up to uh, somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. Uh, they're all trying to send the message. The market should not expect them to cut because the labor market is still strong. They've got to focus on that to try to bring down inflation. But how strong is the labor market? We still don't know. Uh, Chairman Powell really reflection of that. They were building on what Chairman Powers told us, which is basically we don't want to prematurely ease. We want to stay at a high rate, a restrictive rate, and get inflation back down. And Mike, cause some pain. That word pain in the speech on Friday, I think we need to talk about that a whole lot more. He said higher interest rates, quote, will also bring some pain to households and businesses, but a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. When we talk about pain, Mike, in the labor market, what are you looking for to develop in the coming months? Well, the expectation would be that the unemployment rate rises because the Fed is going to crimp economic activity. They have looked at it and said that 3.5 percent, where we are now, is below the natural rate of unemployment. In other words, it's unsustainable, so it would probably rise anyway. And if that's the case, then they think they get into the 4.1 to 4.5 percent range. But they may overshoot. They just don't know. And that could lead us higher. Some people are predicting over 5 or 6 percent. That'd be more of a political problem for the Fed. And that would mean recession, likely. I think Senator Warren would have some more things to say, that's for sure. Mark, you get to catch up, as always. We need a better understanding of how this market's going to respond to incoming information. Yesterday was a decent example of that. We had some good news. Jolts, job openings, still sticky, elevated. That's a good sign for this labor market, although the Fed wants to do something about it. Consumer confidence was better. Good news. Good news, though. Bad news for this equity market. The idea being that this Fed has more to do. So if good news is bad news, what is bad news? Is bad news good news or is bad news just bad news? A sea shark can run around in circles, chase my tail, trying to answer that one. Can you help me understand it? If we get a bad print on Friday in the payrolls report, what does it mean for this market? I, I think it's a, a, a real positive to see um, a weakening uh, labor market um, because it's overly strong, right? The, the economy is constrained in terms of how quickly it can 
grow uh, without driving inflation. And so creating a little bit of room uh, from an employment perspective is really going to be a positive for the overall market. Um, I, I think it's going to take a couple of prints. It's not one number the Fed has told you is not going to be enough to get them to change their minds. They want to see sustained kind of easing of tightness. But we are seeing in supply chains um, that the supply chain uh, tightness is easing. Uh, a, you know, not across the board, but in a lot of the places where we've seen inflation. And I think that the more that story develops with data, uh, the more the Fed is going to feel comfortable kind of starting to back off of its aggressive tightening. Emily, is this the upside down world we've got to live in, where good news is bad news and bad news is good news? Yes, I think it would be good for the markets if the numbers on a Friday surprise to the downside. I agree with Ashish that it's going to take more than, you know, a few data points, but that's what the Fed needs to accomplish. You know, we've we've moved from goods driven inflation to services driven inflation and that unemployment number is going to have to go up if we're going to get inflation numbers to the target that the Fed is that the Fed wants. Emily Hill, Ashish Shah sticking with us. How this Fed communicates to the general public that a higher unemployment rate is the price worth paying to get inflation down. That's going to be really hard. Easy now because unemployment's at 3.5%. A whole lot harder if unemployment's closer to 4% by the end of the year. Right now, futures turning around. Decent bounce, up six tenths of 1%. But relative to the move we've seen over the last three days, it's nothing. We're down about 5% coming into Wednesday. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, well, turning, uh, moving in contrast to the overall markets going higher, we have some big laggards on earnings, starting off with the shares of HP. We do have that stock down sharply after they missed estimates for the last quarter. They have also cut the profit forecast. This is PC demand slow. So you can see the stock is down 6.2%. Chewy down 10.7%. Pet owners are finally pulling back from at least buying pet supplies on Chewy. Uh, perhaps they're sh shopping in stores, but the company has cut their sales outlook on slowing demand. Exxon Mobil down sharply, down 1.7 percent. This, of course, as oil has tumbled back below $90 per barrel. And then finally, PayPal, PayPal Holdings up 3.2 percent. B of A has raised their rating to a buy amid cost cuts and activist interest, plus potential buybacks. Lots of other stocks to talk about this hour. Lots of companies and stocks on the move, John. Abby, thank you. Can't miss the energy move either. Abby mentioned Exxon. Brent crude down 2.6% and 96.73. WTI down by 1.3%. Just about $90 a barrel. A little bit below that a little bit earlier. Coming up, corporate America continues its layoff spree. The Fed brushing off those concerns. I'd be comfortable with some weakness in, in labor markets if we start to see uh, some job losses. But to be honest, we're far from that today. Chairman Powell talked about that pain, that pain you could see. But in his words, and I think this is going to be a difficult one for them to communicate, a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. Is higher unemployment a price worth paying to get inflation lower? That's what the Fed is telling us. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg. Breaking news. Let's get to Abby for more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Yes, we do have a slew of headlines crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now on Snap. Snap says current quarter revenue gains at 8 percent below goals. They're also saying that they will cut 20 percent of their workforce, slashing projects to refocus. They have also appointed Jerry Hunter as the COO while the CBO leaves for Netflix. Netflix. So essentially, Snap will cut 20 percent of its workforce, slash investments, add a new CEO, COO. Uh, the stock is absolutely tumbling on this. And of course, uh, John, the backdrop on this is a weak ad backdrop, ad revenue uh, spending pullback in spending from advertisers on its platform has crippled Snap sales growth this year, uh, again, causing this company to slash roughly 1,300 jobs of the 6,500 and bring its sales outlook down to 8 percent from 13 percent. The stock is tumbling on top of uh, a greater than 70 percent loss into today on the year. Cutting 20 percent of the workforce, that's absolutely brutal. Abby, your read on this. We've talked about this company so many times this year. Industry problem or company execution problem? 
Uh, probably a little bit of both, but I think the thing that stands out the most, uh, John, is if you recall back in April, it was a very sudden turn, not just for Snap, but for the industry in general, where it seemed as though advertisers online were all of a sudden pulling back. So companies that had reported decent first quarters were all of a sudden pulling their guidance. This seems to be a reflection of that. And of course, we are technically in a recession, two quarters of GDP growth down in a row. That tends to bring on these sorts of layoffs. I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to see more announcements of this line. But it is pretty dramatic. 20% is not a small number, 1,300 people, uh, and it really suggests that this company is refocusing their efforts in this more challenging macro environment. Stock is all over the place in the pre-market. Abby, thank you. Very briefly positive now uh, by about a tenth of 1% after being down about 9 or 10% about a second or so ago. Is that the kitchen sink moment for this company? Did we get one for Bed Bath & Beyond? The stock absolutely plunging in the pre-market, down 25%. The struggling retailer closing in on $375 million in new financing as it shuts 150 stores, slashes its workforce. The interim CEO saying the following, we are working swiftly and diligently to strengthen our liquidity and secure our path for the future. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. And, John, when you take a look at that share price, that's actually been a consistent story, unlike Snap, when you think about some of the movements in pre-market. Let's go through some of the sort of details of that plan, the strategic update that we were waiting for, that you really highlighted, of course, in the introduction. Some of the key headlines exiting a third of sort of the owned brands, cutting jobs, closing down stores, eliminating the COO, the chief store officer roles. And, of course, continuing to look at str strategies for the Bye Bye Baby brand. The board there, of course, saying that it still continues to deliver great value as part of that company. But we'd heard talks about maybe a spinoff there. When you think about some of the financing, John, Vital Knowledge, the analysts over there, saying that it actually might provide some breathing room, but it's really unlikely to make suppliers feel that much more comfortable shipping products to the company if they don't think that they will get paid. If you change up the board again, you can talk a lot about profitability. It's a market right now that needs to see profitability. This is not a growth at any cost uh, market. And indeed, analysts now looking at actually 10 more quarters here of some losses ahead. Uh, so really, we're going to be keeping our eyes on this company going forward. It's either bad industry or bad execution. Same question, really, that mm -hmm. I asked to Abby about a different company in a different industry. So well said, certainly poor execution, though the analyst notes this morning, John, writing about really hard to be positive on this company with those macroeconomic headwinds as well. Could I punt this and just say both? You can punt whenever you like. Taylor, thank you. Very, very difficult to find anyone who's optimistic about anything at the moment. Emily Hill, can I ask you the same question I asked Taylor and Abby? And thank you to them both for breaking that down. Are you seeing an industry problem here? an economic problem here or just execution problem at individual companies? It's partially an execution problem, but we've just gone through a massive transition in our economy, right? I mean, we had a global pandemic and we moved to, you know, essentially everyone was staying at home, buying online. And now suddenly consumers are rushing out wanting to have in-person experiences. This has been really tough for companies to navigate. And this is one of the reasons we saw an increase in inventories in July. And so uh, they've been whipsawed, and I'm not surprised that it was difficult to execute in this environment. How do you play defense within this equity market then, Emily, given everything that's going on, and given the fact that I'm really struggling to find anyone who's bullish on anything, apart from maybe JP Morgan and Marco Kalanovic? Yes, well, as you know, we are very long-term investors. So we're not buying for three to six months, we're buying for three years. So I do think that now some of the defensive stocks like consumer staples are probably overvalued. And for, you know, for clients that are already fully, fully invested, we're staying fully invested and we're rebalancing portfolios. For clients who have had a liquidity event and we're putting cash to work, we're being quite opportunistic. So we're focusing on small cap. We are looking at global infrastructure and you know trying to be careful about how and when we get that cash invested i agree that it's difficult to be wildly optimistic about asset classes in general you know i'm the chair of the capers investment committee which is the kansas 25 billion dollar pension fund and we're always asking ourselves you know where are we going to get our returns we have to have a decent retor return in order to provide you know the income stream that the retired teachers and firefighters and policemen need. 
And when you look out the next seven to 10 years, uh, it's, it's hard to find something other than private real estate or private equity that are going to get you much more than 7%. We've had to question so everything. Right, Absolutely you. everything, <laughs> including return assumptions, Emily, as you mentioned. Ashish, we've also questioned the 60-40 portfolio. And then we're all asking now, after a big reset in the bond market, whether you can get that, get that ballast out of the 40 now in the bond market, can you? I, I think you can. I think that the history has been when you go from kind of a very low level of rates and kind of low level of inflation to a higher level, um, you do give something back and, the, and that 60-40 doesn't work as well. But after you have that reset, and we saw this post the taper tantrum in 2013, you saw this in uh, 1994. Um, after you have that reset that actually returns both for risk assets as well as for bonds uh, set up really nicely. And I'd say that this backup in yields actually opens up that 7% uh, uh, threshold for a lot of people you know, to take a lot less risk and still deliver 7% just given the absolute level of rates that are now available in the market. Ashish Shah, thank you, sir. As always, good to catch up with you alongside Emily Hill, the two of them. Helping you get to the opening bell about seven or eight minutes away. Futures are up six tenths of one percent. Barclays put this out, and I think it probably captures and sums up everything pretty well. The central bank acceptance of economic pain as the price to pay in exchange for lower inflation may accelerate the rotation from equities to bonds and cash, while QT is about to gather pace too. We're going to talk a lot about QT in the weeks to come. The tide is already turning. That from the team at Barclays looking for an imminent flight to safety. Your equity market bouncing back just a little bit. Coming up in the morning calls and later, JP Morgan's Jack Caffrey expecting more short term pressure in equities. That conversation at the opening bell from New York. This is Bloomberg. Five minutes away from the opening bell, a small bounce in the equity market relative to the big losses we've seen over the previous three days. The S&P 500 up about a half of 1% on the Nasdaq, up about one full percentage point. That's the price action here at the morning calls. We begin first up with Bank of America upgrading PayPal to buy 114 price target, highlighting multiple upside catalysts, including recent cost-cutting measures. That stock up by 3%. Barclays downgrading Robinhood to underway, expecting inflation and recession headwinds to negatively impact its customer base. That stock is essentially unchanged on the day. And finally, Citigroup downgrading Snap to neutral, pointing to continuing monetization headwinds and growing execution risk. That call came before the news about 15 minutes ago. That stock is up about 11%. I'll bring you the latest in just a moment. Coming up, aside from Snapchat, JP Morgan's Jack Caffrey expecting stocks to eventually overcome a messy bout of volatility. That conversation coming right up with Futures Positive from New York. This is Bloomberg. Another company I've never heard of, opening the New York Stock Exchange. There you go. Woo. From New York City this morning. Good morning. I'm joking. It's a joke. Futures positive. Four tenths of one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq. Up one full percentage point. It's a bounce back after three days of losses on the S&P 500. Three days of losses down. Five percent on the S&P. Will this bounce stick? Let's open and bounce. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this. Yields higher by two or three basis points on a 10-year. 312.87 euro dollar at parity. Just about negative a tenth of 1%. Sterling came really close to a 115 handle a little bit earlier this morning. Crude right now, 89.66, 89.70 is a break of 90. We're down more than two full percentage points. That's the cross asset price action. Let's get you some moves at the open. Here's Katie. Well, John, similar to yesterday, you have big tech leading early gains. Thanks in large part to Amazon. Shares up about six tenths of a percent after three straight days of losses. We'll see if that move holds. Moving on, though, you have Bed Bath & Beyond plunging after revealing its turnaround plan this morning. That, of course, involves shutting 150 stores, cutting 20 percent of its workforce. The company hopes that will reduce costs by about $250 million. But you can see it's hitting shares hard right now down 25 percent. Snap, this is interesting. It's a similar story, but an opposite reaction. Snap also announced job cuts this morning to the tune of about 20 percent of its workforce. 
To rein in costs, of course, as ad revenue slows. It's also adding Jerry Hunter as its COO. As you can see, investors seem to be cheering that early. It shares up almost 10%. HP, though, it's a different story. Under pressure after reporting that sales missed estimates, falling PC demand also led HP to cut its profit forecast. You add that together and shares are about 7% lower. Kenny, thank you. Stocks on the move, as they always are at the opening bound by definition. On the S&P 500, up a third of 1%. Uh, the bottom of the pile, energy down 1.4%. Struggled with the move lower in crude we've seen recently. We're down about 2.5% on Brent. 96.66 on WTI. I mentioned that earlier, a break of 90, 89.54. Big tech closing in on another monthly decline. A lot of that's come in the last few days. Looking ahead to September, historically the worst month of the year for the Nasdaq 100. Abby is back with us for more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, this is really just brutal. We see that year to date decline in the Nasdaq 100 of 23%. And I'm taking a look at one of the functions in the Bloomberg terminal, the HCP function. And the Nasdaq 100 up only two months this year. That's how brutal. Uh, the decline has been and of course uh, this month set for another decline now right now we have a little bit of a bounce back let's see if it sticks because of course to Katie's point we were a little bit higher yesterday the chips, the socks under pressure in particular, supply chain constraints, demand. But of course, the big story here, yields. Yields not doing all that much today, that two-year yield basically flat. But that's not the story on the year or the month. On the month of August, the two-year yield is basically up 50 basis points, going from about 3% below 3% to about 3.45%. As yields go higher, of course, that means everything becomes more expensive. It just speaks to how dislocated markets have been around the Fed, that supposed Fed pivot out of the July meeting that really was never in play. Well, yields reflected that. That pressured uh, tech, big tech, the Nasdaq 100 down. And of course, we are going into the seasonally difficult time. I would have thought that it would have been October, the worst month. But for the Nasdaq 100, uh, John, it is all about September. The average decline over the last five years has been down six tenths of one percent. And of course, if you recall back in 2018, that very difficult fall, it started with a minor monthly decline in the Nasdaq 100. Who knows? We've had so many monthly declines this year. It seems as though September, will it be more of the same? It could be absolutely brutal if so, John. Abby, thank you. The end of August has certainly been just that, brutal. Abby, thank you very much. I was just looking at the S&P 500. It's still 8 or 9%, close to 9 percentage points higher than the June low. At the same time, the bond market at the front end has taken out the June high on a two-year. Remember, the previous high on a two-year was June 14th. The low in the equity market was June 16th. Right now, your two-year up a basis point, 345. So that is above and beyond where we closed on June 14th in the bond market. So if you've got the high of the year on a two-year, should we have the low of the year on the S&P 500? Should we revisit the lows of June? Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson calling this market a victim of its own momentum. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. John, pull up this chart because this highlights exactly the time frame that you were just talking about. The equity market lows of mid-June, the big rebound, and this is where the debate comes in, was this a new bull market as we had re-sort of uh, valued up here, up 20, 25 percent, or just a really big bear market rally. And then unfortunately, from the peak in August all the way down to now, you've erased actually half of those gains. So as you mentioned, you're still only up now about 6 to 12 percent off of the big lows that we had mid-June. So that really is the question. Huge question when we think about QT, and I know that you're going to be talking a lot about this in September, the financial conditions. They're loosening, they're not tightening. Is this actually what the Federal Reserve does not want to see? The whole point of this, again, with that huge big uh, equity rally, was the loosening of the conditions that maybe the Fed did not want to see. The fundamentals, though, John, actually still look good. When you think about, I'll be taking a look actually at the earnings if we have that instead of sort of the individual snap companies. Broadly, earnings are actually still seen an upside surprise. As the uh, moments went on, as the weeks went on, John, earnings actually came in a little bit better than expected, leading to some of that optimism. Well, this is what Mike Wilson's talking about. He thinks this is the moment. For Mike Wilson, it's all about the earnings. Taylor Riggs, thank you. Thank you very much. It's all about the June lows. Are we about to retest them? Jack Caffrey of JP Morgan Asset Management joins us right now. Jack, help me out with that question. Three day losing streak on the SP. We're down about 5%. Are we looking for a retest here of the June lows? I don't know that we have to retest the June lows, but I do think the equity market is to some extent the tail that's getting wagged by the bond market. Um, and so, to the extent we actually, I think, need to see some stabilization starting A in the rates market, B moving into the credit markets before we're really going to see the equity market find its footing in the shorter term. 
Uh, you know, as Taylor just was pointing out to us, you know, we saw a very substantial rally. You know, we can debate whether it was a bear market rally or just a nice rally within an overall market, but that was really prompted by the earnings story. And so, you know, over the next month or so, we're going to have to listen to what we hear on earnings. Uh, companies are taking some steps to fortify their earnings. We talked a bit about that. Um, and some companies are offering some negative guidance, trying to get ahead of where they might see some demand problems. I but I think shorter term, it's going to be messy um, until we can anchor on something more stable. Hey, Jack, what do you have to see, though, in the shorter term to gain a bit more confidence? I brought up this quote from Strategus yesterday. They said that market bottoms usually associated with lower earnings multiples, a higher VIX, a blowout in high yield spreads. We've not seen that yet. Is that what you need to see to get past this hump? I, I do think we need to see some more, what I hate to say is more technical panic in all likelihood. You have started to see some moving higher in input buying. Uh, the VIX, you know, implied volatility in the equity markets moved higher. But I do think you know, the equity market's volatility is still taking its cues from fixed income volatility. Um, you know, it's a little dangerous when the equity portfolio manager is talking about the bond market. Uh, but when I look at the move index, uh, that's sort of in the 120, 130 range and not really making any, any progress lower, it seems like until we get economic data, which is more aligned with what the Fed wants to be hearing, uh, I think equities are going to be taking their cues from you know, interest rates rallying in the shorter term, making this future earnings power a bit pressure. Um, and when the consumer does or does not respond to those higher borrowing costs, you certainly see it, say, in big ticket purchases. You know, look at the, the declines in mortgage applications today. Uh, so there is some sense that some parts of the of the real economy might be responding to rates. What do you think will hold up, Jack? Because in the past, you've given me the impression that you think this economy might prove to be stronger than people expect. Well, you know, I think one of the challenges we have when we try to understand this economy is there's almost no one who's operating, at least in the markets or to a large extent in the economy, that really had the benefit of what you might call the inflation mirage. Uh, you know, the extent that top lines for companies are being powered by the fact that you're looking at whether it was 8 or 9% inflation on a headline basis, to what extent does that hide some of the pressures that we're starting to experience on costs? You know, the issue that may unfold over the next several months, you know, the bullish case is inflation rolls over. If inflation rolls over, then companies lose pricing power. And do companies get squeezed over the course of the next 6 to 12 months where their costs really aren't being able to be managed as well as they've gotten used to with still relatively tight labor markets while simultaneously losing pricing power. Um, I also think we have to deal with this issue of what goes on in Europe. Uh, Europe is seemingly under considerable pressure. It's 15 to 20 percent of most companies, of many S&P companies' revenues. Um, and so we can talk a lot about U.S. data, but we also have to be cognizant that the world is much bigger and the stock market's exposure to the world is much bigger than necessarily the, the economic data we get on a daily basis about just days. With that in mind, Jack, what does that mean for market cap, large versus small, given the Europe story? Yeah, I think at the margin, smaller caps are probably more pressured in the short term over time. Sorry, more pressured in the shorter term with some of the less able to pass on some of the inflation that they're currently experiencing, more exposed to some of the cost pressures. Uh, but over time, Ultimately, I like the greater diversification I get from a global exposure. Uh, but that's a function, really, of, of wanting to compound over time rather being particularly tactical. Uh, my own portfolio is much more globally oriented just because of the market cap means that I need to, to traffic in for the strategy I'm attempting to implement for clients. Jack, I understand all that. And typically, when we talk about a longer time horizon, we'd be overcoming some of these cyclical issues in time. Jack, when you look at the issues in Europe, the phrase that I'm hearing more of, the words I'm hearing more of, is that this won't just be a one-time thing, that you might have five winters of this, maybe even more, listening to the Belgian Prime Minister in the last week or so. The Shell CEO said we need to face reality, that this isn't going to be done and dusted with just this winter. Jack, how are you factoring that into your thinking about a longer time horizon, but ultimately a longer time horizon with the same issues? It when it's an overused saw, but one that I think bears paying attention to here, and that is high prices are the cure for high prices. So right now, Europe is being forced to confront how does it solve its over-reliance on 
what is now revealed as an unreliable source of hydrocarbon supply. What that means for European industrials, what that means for the European consumer. Uh, I think that you're going to see, pro you know, to be realistic, you're going to see some backtracking in terms of some of the pledges that had been made in terms of moving towards more greener technologies. And I think it also encourages is Europe towards a greater diversification. Whether that greater diversification winds up meeting importing fuel from the United States, whether that greater diversification is trying to secure longer term exposures to less problematic fuels in the form of liquefied natural gas. Um, but ultimately, when we look to market solutions, they might not be clean and easy in the shorter term, but they generally get us to where we need to be over the intermediate to longer term. Um, you know, how that plays out necessarily in terms of Europe, not really within my specific bailiwick, but to the extent that Europe is an important part of the S&P, you know, you got to watch it. And I do think that Europe yeah. is taking to diversify, but to some extent, Europe is much cheaper than the U.S. stock market. So that there's some greater sense of, you know, what, when we think about these problems, they're neat and obvious. You can identify the controversy about investing in Europe right now. It's much cleaner, I think, than some of the controversies in the U.S. market. Interesting. Jack Caffrey at JP Morgan. Jack, awesome to catch up with you, sir, as always. About 12 minutes into this one, equities bounce back just a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up by six-tenths of 1%. Long conversation there about Europe. It's such a big issue, not just for the Europeans, of course, but also for the multinationals listed here in the United States with exposure to the European story on both the FX side of things and in terms of the performance of the economy and what it means for revenue, for profit. Coming up, Europe has a big problem. At European level, we have agreed that all member states to do jointly save 15% of energy between August now and March 23. And policymakers are looking for a solution. That conversation, I'm next. European level, we have agreed that all member states to do jointly save 15% of energy between August now and March 23. The second pillar is we need to diversify away from Russian fossil fuels to reliable, like minded sources, mainly also to fill our storages. And here's good news we have reached now an average in the European Union of storage filling of 80%. For once, the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen gets to deliver some good news. That 80% number well ahead of time, a couple of months ahead of time. The EU ramping up efforts to curb soaring energy prices as Russia tightens its grip on gas flows through Nord Stream 1. The French energy minister writing the following. Russia is using gas as a weapon of war. France has prepared for this scenario since the spring. The filling of gas storage will reach its maximum in about two weeks' time. It's all coming as a record inflation print looms over the east. ECB's latest rate decision. Goldman, Bank of America, now looking for 75 basis points from the ECB next week. Team coverage starts right now with Lizzie Burden and Jack Farci in London. Jack, I want to come straight to you, sir. It's a question I get asked a ton, a lot, particularly over the last couple of days, and I don't know how to answer it. What is the plan from the Europeans to kind of disconnect what's happening with gas and what happens with electricity? Well, I think, I mean, you said there's been some good news. Uh, you know, if you want to look at the good news, uh, the, the, the gas price, uh, sorry, the power price uh, for Germany, the one-year forward power price uh, is down almost 50% today compared to the high it hit a couple of days ago. The bad news is that's still 11 times higher than it was at the start of last year. So we're in this moment for, for gas and power markets that is enormously volatile. But fundamentally, uh, the markets are telling you Europe has a really big problem this winter. Uh, we need to reduce demand significantly. Uh, and so far, we don't know what the plan's going to be for that. Jack, have they given any idea of the detail? Because they say they can do something about it. And clearly, people are starting to think that maybe they can. What can they do, if anything at all? Well, I mean, th th this, is, this is going to be the question. So we've got a meeting of, uh, of ministers in Brussels next week. Um, they're clearly going to be looking at something like capping power prices. Trying to, trying to maybe copy the, the Spanish model, which has, which has put a cap on, on power prices and then put subsidies to try and, uh, to try and keep gas-fired 
uh, production and stay competitive in the, in the gas market. Uh, the problem is you need to reduce demand somehow or other. That's what the market is telling you. The market's way of doing that is to put prices up and to the point where people stop buying it. Uh, if politicians are going to intervene in the market, they need to come up with an alternative way to reduce demand. And so far, we have very little detail of that. Uh, and, and we're really heading to a point where we may have blackouts this winter in parts of Europe. We're waiting for that detail. And Lizzie, the ECB is about to hike maybe 75 basis points into this mess. Lizzie, can you frame inflation this morning, what it means for next week? Yeah, Bank of America and Goldman Sachs joining Danske Bank in the prediction of 75 basis points next week. It's not just because of this inflation print, although you are seeing your area inflation at a new record high, 9.1% in August, which is uh, despite oil prices falling in, in August, which means it's broad based, which means it's more likely to last. But economists are also being swayed because of all this hawkish commentary we've had out of the ECB. You've had six members of the governing council now saying that a move bigger than a half point needs to be at least considered. So money markets are seeing a 60% chance of a 75 basis point hike. Let's not forget you've had two 75s out of the Fed. Jay Powell very clear in his messaging at Jackson Hole. That's hard for the governing council to ignore. So the plan would be, at least from the hawk, to front load the hikes, get on top of inflation expectations and avoid being unnecessarily brutal, as Francois Villeroy put it later. Lizzie Burden, thank you. Jack Fauci, thank you to you too. As Lizzie mentioned, the hawks are lining up. We heard from the Bundesbank president yesterday before the CPI print. We heard from him again afterwards. He's looking for decisive action. Going into the CPI print this morning, he said we shouldn't delay the next interest rate steps for fear of a potential recession. You can hear what they're telling you right here. They are willing to hike interest rates into a recession. What does it mean for the currency? We've got a big move for the ECB next week. Stronger currency, weaker currency. That is still an open debate. Had a weaker euro this morning. Just a slightly weaker euro right now. Sterling a whole lot weaker. Sterling came very close to breaking 116 early this morning. In fact, the intraday low was 116, the pound against the US dollar. The team this morning over in London, caught up with Charlie Bean. He's the former Bank of England Deputy Governor. And this is what he had to say about a large sustained deficit in the medium term at risk because of the incoming Prime Minister, if it is Liz Trust, talking about plans to cut taxes and raise spending. He said the following, I could see investors starting to think that the UK doesn't look such a good place to invest. You'll see a risk premium re-emerging on gilts, which is just starting to happen. Stephen Gallo over at BMO picked up on some of this commentary and he agrees. He thinks that this is not just going to be a guilt issue with a risk premium returning, but also an issue that shows up in the currency. And you can see that in pound sterling this morning. And here's the issue that people have got in Europe, particularly the UK, and for the whole of the Europeans. You can have policy intervention on the fiscal side if the bond market's wide open. Back in spring 2020, in a world of low rates, QE, and low inflation, wide open. In a world of high rates, QT, and high inflation, that bond market is not as wide open. And if you're worried about the deficit in the UK right now, there's two ways you can look at attracting international investors. One, you can get rates up, gilt yields have to go higher, or two, the currency has to depreciate, or both. And that's the risk that this starts to feed on itself, and that's the risk people are starting to talk about in a bigger way in the UK. Cable right now, 116.17, with down about a third of 1%. That is a weaker pound sterling. Bit of breaking news out there for you as well. Want to cross over to Abby for that. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do have some breaking news. We have a few pieces of breaking news, but the one that has come out right now is the FDA has okayed the Moderna and the Pfizer BNTech Omicron COVID-19 booster shots. Both of those stocks are higher. The last I looked, Moderna was up more than Pfizer. Both, both stocks are again higher. Also, we had the news that the Chicago PMI came out a little bit better than expected, above 50. That, of course, highlights ahead of the ISM print that will come out tomorrow and Thursday. Will or will they not be above 50 as well? Uh, an important tell on the economy and whether there's contraction or expansion. The U.S. PMIs overall suggest that there could be some contraction, uh, but we do have uh, that Chicago PMI coming out positive. Abby, thank you. 23 minutes in. Nice bounce back here, up six tenths of one percent of the Nasdaq, up a little more than one full percentage point. Trying to take a bite out of the losses of the last few days. Up next, your trading diary.
26 minutes in, equities higher by five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq by more than 1%. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. Let's get straight to it. A White House press briefing coming up at 2.45 Eastern. Fed speak from the Dallas president, Laurie Logan, then Atlanta's Rafael Bostic speaking at 6.30. ISM manufacturing, another round of jobless claims coming on Thursday. Get durable goods and factory orders on Friday. And the main event on Friday too is Payrolls Friday from New York. This is Bloomberg.